Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome you all to another session on machine learning in our practitioners course on analytics. Uh, we talked about uh, different types of machine learning algorithms, the philosophy, the trips, the traps. Uh, let us now get into a quick crash course of the most important form of machine learning or rather the most widely used uh, form of machine learning which is called the classification based algorithms. So, classification just to quickly remind you is all about uh, classifying as the word says. So, in a normal regression our goal is to predict a particular value of the output. In this case we want to categorize the output. So, for example, uh, let us take case of a bank. So, this is one of the most popular uses of classification based machine learning algorithm. So, a bank wants to classify its customers into defaulters and non defaulters. So, a bank is in the business of giving loans, it wants to predict which customers can default, which customers have less likelihood to default. So, this is a classic or a very popular case of uh, classification based uh, algorithm. There can be uh, similar for example, if you talk about medicine. So, based on the different parameters, different uh, vital statistics of a patient, you want to predict whether the patient has a particular disease or not disease. So, these are typically binary classification, you label them as 1 0 or 0 1 depending upon your convenience. There can also be cases where you want to break them into multiple categories. So, for example, you may want to based upon the say in case of HR based upon the different characteristics, different kinds of scores, you want to see to predict whether a person would be a low performer high performer or a mediocre performer. In this particular case, you can also use a regression, but often this categorization can give you uh, slightly better results uh, or based upon different kinds of characteristics, it wants to see whether a person is a better fit for finance, marketing or operations. So, what fits his profile better in terms of his potential performance. So, these kind of problems where the output variable is uh, not a continuous variable, it is a category. So, these are the problems uh, which come into the classification uh, set of uh, algorithms. There are several methods, some of the most popular used methods are something called logistic regression, which is extension of the same principles as of uh, normal regression or linear regression, multivariate regression or bivariate into uh, problems where you have to get them into different categories. Then there are these simpler, but yet very powerful approaches, nave base and an extension of nave base is what is generally called linear discriminant analysis based algorithms and then you have the very classic or very intuitive k nearest neighbors based methods. So, let us uh, have a quick look on each of these methods uh, and then uh, also understand what are the pitfalls, get into a bit detail of it. So, let us start with what I mentioned at very last k nearest 
neighbors. Now, this is the most uh, I would say intuitive or most natural way in which uh, we also try to classify people around us or various things around us. So, what it says is you know the popular proverb that a man is known by the company he keeps. So, basically what you do is let us say draw two parameters let this one be x 1, this one be x 2, let these be any two parameters. Uh, for example, uh, if you are talking of a default, let may be x 1 is a parameter like his uh, past uh, payment record whether he pays on time or not, x 2 may be his account balance. Uh, so, let us not bother about what these exactly are, because depending on the problem these will vary. And then for example, we know certain people defaulted, certain did not default. So, let us uh, put the defaults as, uh, let us classify them as uh, n, let us mark them as n. So, for example, I am just drawing. So, let these are the some points, some people who did not default. And let us assume that these are people who defaulted. So, now for example, assume that you get a new data point. So, you got a data point here for example, let this be a data point. So, you want to predict whether this fellow is he a defaulter or a non defaulter. So, what k nearest neighbor says is that look at the people who are around him, who are the closest people around him. So, you can very easily say that uh, if I choose his closest neighbor probably this fellow is the closest neighbor. If I choose two closest neighbor then probably this and these two are closest neighbor. So, this may be a neighbor, this may be a neighbor. If I have to choose three neighbors these three may be neighbors. If I have to choose four neighbors, then this fellow also becomes a neighbor. So, if I decide that okay, I have I make a rule that I will classify a person as per his closest neighbor. In that case, I will choose this fellow and say that this record is a non defaulter. However, if I say I will choose two default two closest neighbors. Again for 1 he is a non defaulter, for 2 he is a non defaulter, if I choose 3 again he is a non defaulter, if I choose 4 points then 3 points say that he is a non defaulter, 1 point says he is a defaulter, you do a majority vote and then you still say that he is a non defaulter. Similarly, if I had uh, another point which was uh, somewhere here. In this case probably if this was the closest fellow, then we would say he is a defaulter. If next closest was this then among the two then it is kind of equal, you are in a tie. If you choose 3 points then probably again this fellow breaks the tie, if you choose 4 points then again it is a tie. So, what we are doing in a way is that we are polling how many of the nearest neighbors are defaulters or non defaulters and we go by the majority vote. So, typically very intuitive, 
and it works perfectly fine in many simple cases. In fact, a lot of uh, the machine learning algorithms which are used in many recommendation based systems uh, in shopping carts uh, and uh, even some sentiment based analysis, they do this k nearest neighbor methods. And uh, if you look at the results also surprisingly the results come out to be really, really good in many cases. In fact, they beat some of the most advanced algorithms. Uh, but there are there are few riders. Uh, the first rider is that this is very very subject to it's very it's a it's a function of the it is subject to choice of k. K means the number of neighbors that you choose to make the decision. And uh, if you look at a typical uh, profile, if I have to make a graph out here, so let me plot error out here, the mistakes I make if I classify using this. Let me put 1 by k here. So, 1 by k here means that uh, uh, as k increases, I am going close to the origin. So, the furthermost points are those the, the high the lowest can be 1. So, maybe this this extreme is 1 and other values are beneath it and if we plot it we see the plot is something like that. So, as you increase the number of uh, k's if you increase. So, somewhere between this to this you find that you get the least error. And beyond it, if you take more number of neighbors, then what happens is typically it is almost sampling the entire data set and hence uh, your accuracy reduces. Uh, in the initial part, if you choose less number of k, then what happens is that the nearest neighbor becomes a very strong influencer. So, if there have been some odd points here and there, in that case uh, you may still get error. So, what happens is there is an optimal typically range between which it works beautiful. Uh, in most cases. So, typically it is a thumb rule that if k is uh, between 5 and 10, then it works good. Uh, if it is below this, then the model becomes slightly unstable. Uh, the variance is high. If I have to talk in terms of the bias variance discussion we had last time, it is too much adapted to the data set go to new data it may not work fine. Uh, if uh, k is this is when k is low, when k is uh, when k is high then bias increases. So, in a way you are sampling the entire data set and hence your accuracy reduces. So, uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, it is uh, it is very much subject to and, and sometimes when the data set is slightly more complex, uh, the k nearest neighbor may not also work very great. So, you have to keep in mind the between 5 to 10 years typically it works good, but there is another rider along with it and that is the curse of dimensionality. So, when the number of parameters in this case we had worked with only two parameters, but if when number of parameters I mean x 1, x 2, x n. So, if n is large, then it can be shown that most data points in an n dimensional cube. So, if we assume that all data points are part of a cube, so a three dimension is like this is x 1, 
x2, x3. So, if I make an n dimensional and I try to plot and if that be considered kind of a cube. So, most of most data points in n dimensional cube tend to be far apart. So, what happens is it is becomes very difficult to find a, a close neighbor. So, what happens is most of the points are actually quite very much far apart from each other and because they are very far apart from each other the entire notion of having k nearest neighbors does not make much sense. So, it is like uh, you are being in uh, Kanpur and uh, your closest neighbor is in say Norway, the other closest neighbor is in Australia. So, Australia and Norway itself are so far away from Kanpur that does not make sense to even call them as neighbors. But yeah, from a technical standpoint, yes, you can still come out with some results, but they are not actually a neighbor in the strictest sense. So, if you have unless you have very huge number of data points, uh, uh, typically finding these neighbors and actually classifying them as neighbor itself becomes a question mark. So, for when, when the number of parameters is large because they tend to be far apart, it means that k nearest methods are unstable. So, you do not use uh, these methods uh, in this case. So, typically what you do is when you use these methods, we should also consider what is called error rates. So, when you use these methods, there are always misclassifications that happen. So, there will be uh, the uh, there will be uh, data points for which your model will classify them wrongly. So, what you do is you you calculate a metric which is So, do not be scared about this complex term. So, I is like it said it is a it is a very commonly used variable in probability based methods it is called an indicator variable. So, what happens is this I takes a value of 1 if y i not equal to y i cap. So, what happens is this y i cap. So, cap as we discussed earlier it means your prediction. So, you predicted that something is 1, but actually it was predicted as 0. So, 1 and 0 being two different categories. So, if it fails to predict i gets a value of 1, if it correctly predicts i gets a value of 0. So, in this case what happens is basically what you are trying to do is you are trying to sum up all the number of uh, wrong predictions you made and you divide by the total number of predictions that you made. So, n is the total number of data points. So, this gives you an average error rate and your goal is to minimize this error rate. So, if you see that in k nearest neighbor when the number of dimensions is very high the p number of parameters number of parameters if high k nearest is not recommended. So, typically in any classification algorithm that you use you calculate this error rate you calculate this formula your if you are using a software it will uh, itself do the uh, calculation uh, it will give you these kind of uh, estimates and your goal is to reduce it so what we find is that if k for k nearest neighbor this doesn't give a very great result the other simple method which is again very popular is
nave base classifier. So, if you recall your study of probability in class 12, recall there was this base formula. Uh, so, base formula for conditional probability. So, actually the formula is not a very complex formula. Let me just give you a quick refresher. You do not even have to remember, many people try to remember this formula actually you do not have to remember. So, what it says is that uh, for example, what is the probability of P A and B both happening. So, you can say that this is the probability of P A happening and once P A has happened, probability of B happening given that A has happened. So, this slash A means that given that A has happened, happening of B. So, probability of both P A and B happening, you can easily say that it means that the probability of A happening and once that A has happened, probability of B happening. But then you can also swap A and B, right? So, this is also same as P A by B. So, if you compare these two formula, what we basically get is that P A into P B by A is equal to P B into P A by B. Now, Bayes theorem is nothing but a rearrangement of this this basic equation or in other words you know simple terms P B by A is equal to P B into P A by B by P A. So, probability of an event B happening given that A has happened is nothing but probability of the event happening irrespective of whether A has happened into probability of A given that B has happened divided by the total probability of probability of A happening. So, if you remember this equation, uh, this becomes easy to derive and this is what is called base formula or base theorem. And uh, in modern uh, analytics, uh, this very simple, but uh, very intuitive or I would say very insightful formula is the basis of lot of machine learning algorithms. In fact, there is an entire field of Bayesian statistics, uh, which primarily works on this formula. How it works, uh, let me just give you a brief insight and then you will understand that why Nave Bayes classifier becomes a very, uh, very, very attractive tool. In fact, apart from k nearest neighbor, uh, this is one of the most popular tools uh, for most of the recommendation engines that you would come across online. So, let us have some brief discussion on this. So, let me write this formula again for you. So, basically we said that P a by B is equal to, uh, let me put it in a more ordered way divided by P B. So, so, what we are doing is, if you notice this term and this term it gives a way of swapping A and B. So, moving from probability of B given that A has happened to moving to probability of A given that B has happened. Now, in case of uh, analytics, uh, many a times what happens is, uh, now if you look this A, this A was your original estimate of probability of A happening. So, if you consider B 
to be an information or a new data received. So, what it says is that given that you receive a new data point or maybe you know let me call it D, so that it is easy to visualize. So, given that a new data point that you received the probability. So, this was P A was your prior probability this is called a prior. Now, D by A is that given that A is the situation what is the probability that you could get this new data in the first place. So, what you find is that and if you divide that by the probability of getting this data irrespective of whether you got A uh, or you did not get A. So, you find that if A be the if P A be the probability of an event A happening this formula gives you a way to adjust that probability given that a new data point has received. So, given that you now got a new information new data point you revise your estimate of A. So, the probability of A now. So, what happens typically is that and the, the reason it becomes so powerful in analytics is that what you do is you you, you start with some in a typical case you start with some assumption about this probability of A whatever be the value. And then you say you have received so you take first data point you say that what is the probability of I getting this data point given that A has happened you multiply by this do this calculation I will not get into the further details of into this because it is a field in itself. But what happens is after that you after that iteration you get a revised probability of A. Now, in the next step you again put this value here again get the new data and again revise your estimate. So, after some time some iterations that you do in a way simulations that you do you get a stable value of probability of a given that all the data that you have received. So, this is the way uh, a lot of classifications happen for example, if you are uh, deciding whether who will win an election. So, given that a new data point receives you you keep refining your probability of A winning A being say a candidate winning the probability of a candidate winning based on new data you keep refining keep refining ultimately the model comes to a stable state and uh, you you come to your prediction. So, that is what uh, this Bayes theorem is about. Now, if you uh, recall here this actually this uh, P A now what happens is that this P B is actually probability of B by A into P A plus probability of P given that A complement into P A complement. Now, in reality a lot of these calculations become complex especially if there are multiple parameters. So, what you do is you make certain assumptions simplify those calculations and then use this Bayes theorem. So, let us take for an example a case of uh, spam handling. In email. So, say for example, you get a lot of mails some mails are spams the mails which are not spams they are called hams that is just a lingo. Suppose you got one objectionable word uh, for example, let the word be virus. So, basically you you make a rule or you know that you know if uh, a word virus comes in the mail then there is a high probability of the mail being spam. So, there can be other words also. So, for example, you do an analysis and finally, you you based upon your review you found you make a matrix of presence of word virus 
versus versus not presence of virus and a mail being spam or not spam so for example you you make this table and so for example there were four cases when the word spam was present and uh, word virus was present and it was a spam mail and there were 16 cases when the word virus was not present yet it was a spam so and similarly there was one case when the word virus was present but it was not a spam and there were 79 cases when word virus was not present and it was also uh, not a spam it was a ham so let this be this so we have 100 points we have around 95 points here and we have 5 points here so this is what it looks like so what you do is you calculate the likelihood based upon this of something being a spam or not spam. So, you, you try to calculate likelihood out of this. So, how you do is very simple you just divide these by. So, if I have to convert this into a, a likelihood table. So, the table would look, look something like this So, you had 20 points here, you had 80 here, this was 100. So, you divide each of them by this 20. So, this becomes 4 by 20, this becomes 16 by 20, this becomes 1 by 80, this becomes 79 by 80, this becomes 5 by 100 this becomes 95 by 100. So, this becomes your likelihood table. Now, what you do is the trick that you do is you say probability of something being a spam given that the word virus came is equal to probability of word virus given that it is a spam into probability of it being spam by probability of the word virus. So, note this term this is your likelihood. So, what we are calculating is here is that probability of some being virus given that it is a spam. So, you know that from here this is the prior probability of something being a spam. So, in this case you know that the prior probability was 20 by 100. So, that is the prior probability and you know the probability of something being virus was 5 by 100. So, in a way you calculate this you can easily calculate this probability. So, what Nave Bayes theorem does is something more. So, here it was a simple case of just one word virus. Now, assume that there are many other words that you took. So, for example, apart from virus maybe there is another word common word Viagra for example, then there may be some other word prize. So, you may have these kind of tables or you can have another word like money. So, in a way 
you have a bigger table. Let me just try to draw that table for you and then we will understand it slightly better. So, let us just have four words to begin with. Let this be word 1, whatever be the word, it may be Viagra, it may be grocery, it may be price, it may be money, it may be virus. So, these are the four words and maybe let me for sake of clarity make the divider with a double line. So, this is yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no and this being a spam, this being a ham. So, for each of them you have some values here, In you have some uh, in this case for example, for this we knew it was like 4 by 20, 1 by 80, 16 by 20 and it was 79 by 80. So, similarly based upon uh, the sample that you have taken, you have this field. Now, the probability and for example, a case came where uh, this was yes, this was no, you got a you got a mail where this particular first word was present, the second word was not present, the third word was not present, fourth word was present. So, the probability of it being a spam given that first word was present and second word was not present. So, let me just put it by a complement which is the an, a horizontal line over this and word 3 was also not present and word 4 was present. This by Bayes theorem is nothing but probability of given that it is a spam into probability of something being a spam divided by probability of now notice from this particular table you can actually calculate all the permutations combinations and then because you know each of these so p w1 and w2 which means you know this part and then this part and this part you know so you can actually calculate and do this it's a simple algebraic exercise that you would have done in your class 12 so, this is the way the nave base is used. However, what happens is that this calculation of this actually, in this case we had just four uh, examples. So, maybe you can just uh, uh, do some kind of a manipulation, but uh, this wherever you will do if you do by you know and that is why it is called there is this notice this word nave. Nave means very simple. So, what happens is we unconsciously make an assumption that these 
this W1, W2, W3, W4 are independent. In reality, this independence may not be there. So, what happens is in reality, this particular formula, this particular term, this and this. So, they are very, very difficult to compute, because there may be relations between W1 and W2. So, it is like saying that if a male has W1, the probability of W2 also happening is, is influenced by this. So, they are not actually independent. So, what happens is in naive bias theorem, you simply assume that they are independent. The moment you assume they are independent, then you know that P A intersection B for independent events is nothing but P A into P V. So, in this case, for example, moment you assume them to be independent, all you do is you replace this by something P W 1 given it is a spam into P W not 2 given it is a spam multiplied by W not 3 given that it is a spam multiplied by W 4 given it is not a spam. So, you simply replace that by a product. Similarly, you replace the denominator also by a product and uh, you just then it is a matter of simple calculation. So, what happens is you do this calculation and uh, for each of these combinations for example, you, you start filling the numbers and you find out that the probability of it being a spam given that W 1 happened and W 2 did not happen and W 3 did not happen and W 4. You calculate this value, uh, it comes to some number. Similarly, you calculate the value of ham. You do the same exercise again that what is the probability that it was not a spam for the same thing. You do a calculation of this, whichever is greater. If this is greater than this, then you classify it as a ham. If this is greater than this, you classify it as a spam. So, in reality, what you do is this value actually does not strictly. So, what happens is in a smart case, you notice whether you are calculating spam or you are calculating ham, this value actually does not matter, this is constant. It does not have any term of spam or ham. So, in general what happens is you simply ignore this, simply ignore. The moment you ignore all you have to do is you have to just calculate this numerator. So, what happens in a calculation is that instead of probability, you in a way calculate the likelihood, just the numerator. Similarly, likelihood you simply calculate the numerator and to convert it. So, if this P P S or L S, if this be L S and this be L H, then what you do is probability of spam is equal to L S by L S plus L H, probability of ham is equal to L H by L S plus L H. So, you calculate this and then you are done. Now, one of the issues that comes here is that you have assumed that these are all independent 
in reality this independence uh, does not hold good. The other concern that happens is uh, you took four words, suppose tomorrow five new words got added and then you got a uh, and uh, these are like completely new words for which you do not have any data point. So, in those cases what happens is that some of these terms may actually have 0. So, if these are 0 and you are multiplying, so this term actually becomes 0. So, you get actually after doing all this calculation, these values simply because a term did not exist, it becomes 0. So, what you do is there is something called Laplace estimator which is nothing but you say that I will not allow 0 to happen, you make sure that it is never 0, it is minimum of 1 and any value 1 by 1 divided by uh, total values and something else. So, you make sure it is always non-zero. So, if it is non-zero then calculation becomes simple. So, this is in summary the naive bias. Now, in naive bias we assumed let us be very clear assumed independence of W 1, W 2, W 3, W n. Now, there is this is a part of a more generic algorithm set called linear discriminant analysis. In linear discriminant analysis what you do is that you do not necessarily assume independence and what you do is this uh, this prior you assume it to be a Gaussian or a normal distribution and then it is a complicated formula. So, what happens is the output is also comes out to be a Gaussian and then terms comes out to be a linear equation. So, uh, that is something called a linear discriminant analysis you make more complex assumptions about the nature of uh, probability distributions you have something called quadratic discriminant analysis. So, these are different uh, uh, methods which are used. However, the naive bias is computationally very efficient, very simple and for most cases it kind of suffices. But let us be very clear that because it assumes independence, it also assumes that every factor is equally important. So, what happens is what happens is that if you take too many factors and uh, your problem designer has has been kind of too finicky about it, your models tend to get very very unstable because there are too many factors. Suppose instead of these words I would have uh, instead of phrases he would have broken even the phrases into words and he would have chosen every hundreds of words, then it would have become very, very complex. And also these are like good if the data is largely categorical uh, in case presence or non presence of words. If it was numeric variables, then it would have problems, then you would have to break those numerical variables into different. Uh, so, for example, instead of presence or non presence of word, we had something like count of words or length of email. In that case you would have to split these lengths and counts into low, medium, high different categories and then try to use and you find that the algorithm then does not work very, very great. So, but it is you need to be very clear that it is very fast, it is simple and I would say also effective in many fuzzy cases, fuzzy in the sense when the data is also not very clear accurate, uh, it turns out to be very accurate. Uh, also training is quick, you do one basic sampling of your emails and it can smartly train itself. And, uh, 
also if the data is noisy or there are lot of missing values with laplace estimation it tends to work pretty well so and that is the reason that for many online applications the use nave bias or one of its modifications for example uh, your uh, recommendation engines in most of these shopping uh, e-commerce sites etc all likelihood are going to be nave based based methods okay so now let us move to a more serious method uh, nave based is also serious i am not saying it is not serious but something which is used a lot in enterprise based situations very popular in fact if you talk in terms of its usage then it is probably more applied or more more widely used than even uh, linear regression and this is the logistic regression so in logistic regression is nothing but your your linear regression was nothing but a0 plus a1 x1 plus a2 x2 up to an xn where these a0 a1 a2 these could be either or these x ones rather these x ones they could be either continuous variables or dummy categorical variables and y was a continuous variable what if i want y to be a discrete variable or rather a categorical variable i want finally the answer to come as something like a 0 or 1 so mostly logistic regression is used for binary classification there are extensions of logistic regression for uh, non binary or uh, multinomial classifications but they are not very popular the most popular use is for binary classification so in this case what you do is there is something called a logistic function so logistic function so i am assuming i am i am starting with simple case of just one single variable logistic regression and the same thing extends to multi variable so this is the function so if you swap do some elementary algebra you will find that px by 1 minus px is equal to e to the power p0 plus b1x if you take log of both sides natural log will find log of px by 1 minus px is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x so this particular term is called a log odds or logit function so this term if you now note is almost same as that of linear regression the y term is slightly different now what you try to do because it's a classification algorithm now this is kind of a log or like if you if you just roughly think that you know this p be a kind of a probability it is kind of a, a log of something happening versus something not happening that comparative ratio so what in this case we do is uh, we try to actually maximize something called a likelihood function so 
So, this is how the mathematical form is evolved. So, which is nothing but So, this is basically a symbol for product. So, we all know sigma mi is symbolizes sum, this symbolizes product. So, what it is trying to do is it is calculating uh, the parameters for which this, this is called likelihood. It tries to find those parameters for different betas that maximizes this particular probability. So, this is called a set of you know methods called maximum likelihood estimator methods. So, maximum likelihood estimators. So, similarly if you were doing a, in this case if it was you are doing this was for a bivariate case, if you are do having multiple variables the same function would look something like log of p x by log of 1 minus p x is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta n x n and the same formula that comes. So, here what happens after you have done this thing, it comes with a value, you convert that value into a probability and if the probability is greater than 0.5, you say it belongs to a class 1, if it is less than 0.5, it belongs to class 0. So, thank you very much, we will continue this further and then take ahead from there. Thank you very much.